so, um, hey, um, I'm Linda, and I'm very nervous right now. Um, and the reason I'm um, very nervous is because in about six years ago, I decided to take a break from doing talks, writing articles, doing interviews, awards, and social media, though I wasn't big on social media. Um, so I kind of need to rewind a little bit to tell you a little bit about me as to why I wanted a break from those things. Um, this is the bit where I need to talk about myself, which makes me feel very uncomfortable. Um, so I, I studied VizCom at UTS, and after that I got a job at Nelmsmith Ashton. I think Andrew's here, thank, thank you. Um, I learned so much there, and from there I went to a very influential design agency of the time called Moon, and um, you heard Ant and Amanda speak yesterday, and I had the privilege of working with them at Moon. I worked super hard in my 20s, so much so that I became a creative director at Moon before the age of 30, and I continued on that trajectory of creative directorship um, at Moon, but also then later on in my 30s in another place called Holzbosch. Um, in, as, as a creative director, I got to work on some of Australia's biggest brands across retail, travel, financial services, um, and the arts, like um, Sydney Opera House that was mentioned previously. So as a creative director, it's kind of your aspiration as a designer. You're like, you know, um, I love ideas, I love the craft, and, you know, I get to um, build all this great work based on idea and um, craft, and I get to nurture people to, to grow that. That's really the exci <laughs> exciting bit, is that, that product component, um, shaping the product of the agencies that you work for. And, and, um, the, the peop and working with people to nurture and foster them. Um, but there's also another component, which is profile. And that was literally one of my KPIs in all my creative directorships. And profile is all about, you know, writing, in, um, do, you know, writing for leadership pieces, doing articles, um, doing interviews, doing talks like this. And I absolutely hated it. I'm an introvert. It's probably going to take me a month to get over this conference. Um, and I, I found it taxing and exceptionally uncomfortable. Um, this is a photo of me, um, uh, actually in a mainstream magazine, full page. I did not want that interview. I did not want that photo. And I was actually trying to hide, and they wouldn't let me conceal my um, eyes. But um, I found it on a move recently, and um, it really is telling of how I felt at, at the time, really unco um, uncomfortable with it. But I think also, um, at that time, there weren't very many female creative directors, so I was kind of, um, kind of an, I hate to use this language, like an easy target. When I look through all the stuff that I've got where I've appeared, there's like nine male creative directors and then there's me. So I felt like I was an easy win for journalists and things like that. But amongst um, this tenure in um, senior leadership roles, I, I had a child. And... Um, in 2016, I kind of got to this place where I was like, oh, you know, I feel like I'm serving clients, I'm serving business, serving the industry and doing all this profile stuff, but my family's coming kind of on the bottom of the list. And, and that whole industry thing is like an extracurricular activity because you're doing your product and people work, you know, basically in the main part of your day. So in 2016, I decided to resign from my role and just take some time out. And what that meant was really my son was beginning kindergarten in the next year, and I'd worked full time since he was pretty much born. Um, and so I thought, you know what, here's my chance before he goes to school just to enjoy some time with him and ha hang out, and, and it was absolutely really wonderful. Um, it's a shame he can't remember it now, he's a little older. But during that space, when I um, took some time out, I started to kind of rethink, um, it actually gave me space to not rethink what I wanted to do, because I loved creative directing, I loved working in brand and identity and, and, and design, but it was about more how I wanted to do it, because I felt um, for 15 years I'd been fulfilling the expectations others had of my, my role, and all of a sudden I kind of had this clarity with space that actually I could make better choices for myself. 
So the first thing I thought to myself was like, I'm cutting out these profile things. I don't have capacity, um, and th it's not really an area that I, um, I, I enjoy. I then also, um, during that time, I had a bit of a trip to Munich, um, just with my husband, and it was for a wedding, and we didn't have much time to by ourselves because it was this social event, but we did end up in a schnitzel house one night, and I, anyone who knows me I knows I love schnitzel, and, and on a scrap piece of paper, which I still do have, but um, I, w I was going to put it up there, but I also wrote a few other things which I was just like, mm, maybe not for everyone's eyes. Um, I wrote a list of all these things that I didn't want to do anymore. I, I didn't want to work with clients who didn't align with my values. I didn't want to schmooze. I didn't want to jargonize. I didn't want to do ta-da's. I don't know if you know of the ta-da. It's the client briefs you. I go away for four weeks and then, ta-da, here's your creative ID. I didn't want to do all, the, all that sort of stuff. I didn't want to live in this grab at all. Anyone who's worked in big agencies, you know, let's do the land grab. And then um, anyone who's worked with me knows I do not like mandarins and that <laughs> I wanted to continue. No mandarins. <laughs> it's just a thing. It's a childhood trauma. Um, so, but what, I, what did I want to do? And look, to be honest, it was so basic. I just want to work with good people. I want to do good things. I want to keep these conversational, be conscientious, build my own confidence because Strangely, even though I'd done things for 15 years and I was top of, you know, uh, work in terms of what I was doing, I, I, hadn't, I still didn't believe in myself. And the most important thing is I wanted to take clients on a journey because what they're doing is a journey and, and often the clients we work with in branding, it's sometimes once in a lifetime that they're going to take that journey. I also want to be, I wanted to be taken on a journey I and mean, that goes back to, I didn't want to be the know-it-all. I wanted to understand the client and be taken on that journey with the client. Um, and I wanted to do dutiful design, which was like, you know, stop looking at everyone else and just focus on doing design that is effective and impactful for that client. And I wanted to also eat cake. Um, and um, my background's Croatian, and I don't know if any of you have a Slavic background. Um, there's an expression in Croatian which is ayoy, which means, oh dear, because <laughs> this transition of letting go of the expectations um, and kind of really stepping into what I believed in and, and who I wanted to be, with that came a lot of discomfort. It also meant that I had to dig deep and find my courage and also kind of like foolishness, like what the hell am I even thinking about um, actually kind of, you know, being kind of my own self. Um, so, uh, um, so basically about a year after I um, resigned from my role at Holzbosch, I set up my own business and I called it a company. And yes, the little skit that they did earlier on is basically what happens every time I ring up to order anything. It, it really does happen. Um, it's a bit ironic that I brand and I didn't do the vo verbal test. Um, <laughs> But a company is very much about um, all those beliefs I just talked about, taking the client on a journey and being taken on a journey, this kind of working with and, and, along, and alongside. So um, we are a studio of, that focuses on brand identity and communication design. Um, you know, uh, many of the senior people within the team, it's, we've got big agency experience, but for us it's all about this boutique attention. We are Sydney-based, Global Reach, and we started as a party of three, and we are now eight. So by now, you're probably wondering, where's the work? We want to see the work. So um, when Matt um, asked me to talk, and I was very reluctant because, like I said, I would kind of wanted to stop doing all these profile pieces, but then he talked about wanting me to be very, you know, open, and, you know, wear your heart on the sleeve, tell your authentic story. Um, and through the lens of your design philosophy, um, the first thing that kind of came to my mind was that uh, this idea of rewilding and that this whole business, so it's been in existence for five years now, that a company has been a project in rewilding. And what does that mean? It means this, re you know, finding the rebalance of self and then for the business developing this 
ownable garden patch. I know there's a bit of a garden theme happening in some of the talks. That's not intentional. So I don't know if any of you know about rewilding. Um, I belong to the community garden, and so I got kind of acquainted with this idea of rewilding, and I thought, this is kind of interesting. Um, look, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not going to get dig deep into what rewilding is, but in my own little description, it's the procreation, preservation, and protection of nature to create optimal environments for habitats to thrive. So look, we've kind of stuffed the planet, and so this idea of rewilding is about returning nature to its natural self and creating behaviours that can actually create habitats for life to thrive and, and, and burst. And so for me, a company all of a sudden became this idea of procreating, preserving and protecting of an identity um, that I had just shared with you, those value sets, to create a brand to enable a business to thrive. And I felt like there was a duality here with not just um, my own intentions, but also the intentions of the businesses that we wor work with, that this would also apply to them. So I'm going to share with you some um, principles around rewilding. I feel like nature is one of our greatest teachers and that how we've taken those principles, and, and they have not been explicit. I mean, Faz, who works with me, has, you know, <laughs> I've not laid out this manifesto of rewilding, and that's how we work. But um, it's been interesting when I outline the principles, how much um, parallel there was with our work. So the first is about choosing diversity, and that's been a big theme that a lot of people have mentioned today. So within nature, we know that the most healthy and the most strong ecosystems are those that are the most diverse. And so for us at Oak, a company, we, um, we're not a monoculture, and that applies in, on three levels. In the team that makes up the business, um, and it also is the type of clients we have, and also the outputs we make. So within the team itself, we're, all a, uh, we're a mix of ages, genders, um, though strangely, we, a lot of males don't seem to apply to, to work for us. We, we don't know why. We're, we do have a female skew. Um, and we've got a very many cultural backgrounds within our team. And that's really important for me um, because of my own cultural background and this idea that um, you know, we've got all different individuals with different experiences and point of view and it can create a much more enriched and creative process and many more outputs. From the client perspective, this is some work from the last two years. And I kind of like to think our style is agnostic in the sense of... Um, we really respond to the brief. So, you know, we've worked with a millennial SPF skincare brand that wanted weird and wacky, but then we moved to a financial advisory firm who wants sophisticated and polished, and then we work with a software as service, and we make it all about verbal identity and typography, um, and then we have a corporate benefits business. Um, and so, with each one, we've really tr tried to find its own unique aesthetic, but um, appropriate to that particular brief, the audience, the proposition, et cetera. Um, and then obviously that translates in the multi-dimensional quality of the outputs we produce, whether it be a website, whether it be a, a, a tote bag. But at the core, it's always um, that enrichment from, um, that comes from that diversity in, as I mentioned, the team and the, um, that cross-category um, client list that we have. So intrinsic value within rewilding, it's all about embracing um, the virtues of every element. So even a weed can have, um, has, a, has a purpose and a role within nature. And so when we work on a project, it's very much about developing and defining resources that are meaningful and relevant for, that, um, for each client. So I'm going to share with you um, a snapshot of a case study um, and, and, and show to you how we uh, have kind of looked at the virtues of every single element. So Australian Ethical is a pioneering Australian um, ethical investing business, been around since the 80s. They came to us for a rebrand. There's a comprehensive strategy piece, but I'm not going to bore you with that. But I'm just going to show you the snapshot of you know, the key um, the, the, the key blueprint that was developed, we're here to open people's eyes to a better world, we want to be switched on, we want to be a change agent, a motivating force, keep it compelling, relatable, you know, we want to attract people who give a shit, whether that be institutions, financial advisors, or whether it be direct consumers, 
And, and the core idea was this idea of positive action, because in the space of sustainability and CSR and all those sorts of things, there's a lot of scaremongering. You know, this is what this is the awful stuff that's happening in the world. So you must invest positively for positive change. But here they wanted to embrace all the positivity that comes out of um, making active and positive choices. So for us, the first step was the logo. Oops. Oh yeah, here it is. And um, this was inspired by that whole change agent motivating force idea. We wanted to create this sort of living entity, this living being that felt very natural and so very disruptive in the financial services space, but also had this idea, as I mentioned, that was that tick, ticking the box of how do we create something that speaks to the change agent idea. And then um, we created this... Oh, here it goes. And then we created this visual language around Windows. So we, we thought, OK, we have all these formats that we need to work within, and we want to open people's eyes to a better world. And if we create this um, sort of window structure, we can use this window structure to frame and reveal different ideas ar around positive action, positive change. And then those, uh, there's assets within that. So, for example, the illustrations were a key component of us tapping into that positive action sentiment. They're really vibrant, um, they're very positive, they're very inclus uh, inclusive. But there were other elements that were really critical for us in terms of that intrinsic value around every, um, you know, making every single element a purposeful choice. So, for us, for example, the typography, because everything was so vibrant, they were worried about the credibility because they are in the financial sector and they do perform really well. So for us, we were like, okay, we're going to choose a serif and we, um, because the serif is going to offset all the vibrancy of the illustrations and the bright colours and give you that sort of, you know, when people will look at it, get that reassurance that they know their shit and that they're actually good at their stuff. And then, um, and then, yeah, iconography and photography, again, making sure that those elements were relatable and um, so collectively ensuring that all the assets um, spoke to that brand blueprint that I shared with you previously. Um, this one moves kind of away from the actual practice of design and more to the social component of rewilding. So um, within the rewilding concept within nature, it's very much about this idea of grounding people and connecting people back with these deepening relationships and connectivity. So um, the, 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 uh, I wanted to share with you the coffee club, and I'm not going to go into detail about the case study of coffee club, but more what I wanted to show you was how um, really deepening connectivity and relationships proved very valuable for this particular project. So we start with, actually they're in Brisbane, and so we start with them, and there's a comprehensive strategy process. Anyone who you know gets strategy, there's a lot of audits, there's a lot of qual and quant. You know, the overarching objective is they've got great brand awareness. Their consideration is dropping year on year, so we need to um, revitalise that. So um, you know, they're doing great changes with their menu. They're doing back-end technology changes, customer service. So they're really doing a great job of rethinking how they, they deliver their experience. And so for us, they came to us and they said, look, we need a new brand toolkit um, to, yeah, we need a new brand toolkit that can take um, our, our brand back to market and reinvigorate um, interest and consideration for the brand. So the new toolkit looked like this, but there was one um, element we weren't allowed to touch, and that was the logo. And from the outset, when they came to us, we, were, we knew we had to go there because we're like, if you're making these substantial transformations, you're going to have to change the logo. But there was absolute resistance to that. And we had a very big stakeholder group. We had a board in Bangkok, we had the C-suite in Brisbane, and we had three founders across Australia. So we got this new toolbox that came out of several months of um, work. And, you know, we demonstrated what that's going to look like, and we're like, oh, my God, wouldn't it be better with a logo? And <laughs> with a new logo, and, and n other than the CMO and the CEO, no one else was um, 
No one else was like up for it. They were just like, absolutely no. So we we're ready to go to market with this. It's about July. And, and then the CMO and I had this conversation and I'm like, we need to change logo. And she's like, I know. What are we going to do? And so we completely put the project on hold for a month and decided, you know what? Um, we're just going to spend time with the stakeholders. We're not going to do any design work. We're literally just going to ring them up, have video calls, go to Bangkok, spend a few days with the board members, and we're just going to talk. No agenda, so it was not me sitting there going, you must change the logo. Um, wouldn't it be awesome for the transformation? It was literally all about listening and connecting with them. So much so that um, uh, with one particular board member who was the, the hardest one, like, um, we call it the donut turnaround moment, because she was really like absolutely not under my reign. This is not happening. And um, her and I connected over donuts. <laughs> another food that I enjoy. And all of a sudden, she's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to think about this. And, and she was the tipping point after, um, as I mentioned, just a month of just talking and listening. And, and they said, you know what? Um, let's see. Let's see where you can go with this. So we went back to the, all the strategic work we had, but also then inputted everything that we'd gleaned from these really... It was like therapy and DNM. I was very, very exhausted after these stakeholder sessions. And then, you know, showed them what could be possible. And we got a new logo across the line. Um, yeah. So the, the premise and the takeout of this was really, as a designer, I just want to do. You give me a problem, I want to solve it. And I want to do a great job doing that. And this was one of those moments which just reminded me to ground me, to go, you know, actually, we're, we're working with people and actually that relationship component is critical. Uh, you know, sometimes more important than the actual design. So, um, yeah, so that was a very exciting outcome. And so then, yeah, several months later, they went out to market with that. Um, stepping back and letting the process shape the outcome. So within nature, there's a vitality in letting nature shape itself. I mean, I'm sure you've seen, if, you know, these, where, where that actually happens. And so there's two projects um, here that I'll quickly go through where, so my background is very, you know, strong to strategic base, but there are some clients who that won't play and they want a more instinctive process and it's just about really seeing where the process takes you. So Marino is a construction and building consulting firm. You know, he just wanted a nice logo he could put on his ute and shirt. We, we did some marks, we looked at some colours, and we kept on going round and round with him with colours. And he basically came in the studio one day and said, look, it has to be grey, it has to be fluoro, orange and red. And we're like, oh no, 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 please, <laughs> no. And um, he came from a practical place, I can buy off-the-shelf safety equipment in those colours, and I can buy grey shirts, and then they won't show any dirt. So um, we take the design, and we play it out in his colours, and we're like, oh, no, this is just no, so no, not a good idea. But um, we did do it, and interestingly, this project, despite us not liking the colourways, has obviously proven effective for him. The industry, we've had really great response from the industry and funnily one of the things has been colour that people have really um, gravitated towards. So who knew that those colours could work? Um, and then another example of um, letting you know the process kind of shape the outcome was with a client we had which was an urban design and architectural practice and we did a discovery session with them, a brand workshop, and we came up with these four territories um, and we, because they were visually savvy, we thought we're going to use um, design to demonstrate these different territories. So we had this idea around the sum of the partnership and they really had a strong point of view and we thought we could kind of anchor it in a narrative. We had another identity. We thought the W and the M were a gift because they talked a lot about reflecting about sight and then inflecting the opportunity. They talked a lot about responsiveness to sight, so we thought, let's do a malleable mesh, and it can be animated, and the logo can move around it. And then we had this other idea where they talked about modern-ish, um, 
where we had a very structured um, W and M, but then we had this kind of little delightful um, kick because I talked about function and fun um, and, and this kind of tension between um, the, the, yes, being really structured but, and rational, but also quite emotional and playful. So they chose this idea. So you, for us, it was, again, you know, using the creative process to shape um, the outcome. We explored more variations because they were like, oh, actually, it's just a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> they wanted a more graphic and more structural, which we did. And then they came back and said, actually, no, this is more original, but hey, let's re look at the you know, shape of the arc and the angle of the kick, which we did. And then also, you know, um, playing with them around um, scale. So that was another um, where their inputs around scale were really kind of critical in defining that visual language because um, we wanted to use a big everywhere and they were like, no, 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 it has to um, have this kind of generous quality in some and then in others uh, really small. And then finally, creating self-sustaining systems. So um, in nature, um, the idea is that nature should be able to take um, care of itself. And when nature does take care of itself, it flourishes. And what's interesting about self-sustaining systems in nature is that it does enhance the resilience of nature um, by it being self-sustaining, but also it restores integrity. One of the things that really frustrated me when I was working in previous agencies is we would work so hard on these identities um, and then we would create the guidelines and then devoid of working with the internal team, then we walk down the street and see the brand come to life and we're like, oh, that's not how we, it's supposed to look. And we'd be alarmed and then little did, did we know that the internal team was telling the CMO that guideline document was so useless. So. <laughs> um, for me, what's been important is this idea that we work very closely with the internal team and that we are working towards um, creating a brand system that they can, the internal team themselves can own and run. So really empowering the internal um, design team. So this is actually a project that we haven't gone live with yet. We're still building the case study, but. Bailey Nelson, um, I'm wearing their glasses. Some of you may be um, wearing their glasses as well. They're a national um, eyewear and eye um, care, uh, yes, uh, retailer. So they've got a really strong e-com platform. They've got 100 stores in Australia. They're in New Zealand, North America, um, and the UK. And so they came, um, they came to us at the end of last year, and uh, again, a plethora of different strategic objectives for the project which I'm not going to get into because that's a half an hour case study in itself, but one of the key critical um, objectives was to develop a system for them that they could actually own and run with themselves. Um, and, then, and that would be to the global internal team. And this is retail, which means they're always on, they're creating assets all the time. And where they'd got themselves into a position was really kind of fussy work, um, which would not only be really time consuming, but it, formed this place where they, it was very fragmented in the look and feel, and it lacked cohesion, and also in, in I know I said no jargon, but it lacked cut through, so they, so they were getting you know, confused with all these other eyewear and, eye, and other D2C um, uh, um, brands. So um, we did a big audit with them, and we spoke a lot with the internal team about their everyday implementation and their role and rollout of the assets to really understand what's playing out in MREX, leaderboards, in you know, social media, on their e-com platform, in store, like every possible um, piece of touch point that they produce. And from that, which was a several month process, and I didn't want to bore you with what that looks like because it was a very detailed process, we ended up with this new brand. So it's new, um, got a new word mark, which was kind of an output of the process. But the main piece of the work here really was developing a system, as I mentioned, that would be cohesive and easy to implement across any touch point, any channel by any member of their internal team. Um, and this is what it's looking like. So it meant us developing a system that would work on outdoor, on merchandise. This was a test for us, and hopefully next week I'll get some samples. 
is, you know, what does that word mark look like at two millimetres on the arm of a, um, on a pair of glasses? We've actually had to make a small scale version of the logo for that. You know, e-com, how, how does that translate to that? Social media. So like I said, a lot of interrogation, but all about creating a self-sustaining system. Local area marketing. And this nearly killed us point of sale. So like we went round and round and round, but we needed to create a system that enabled them to tell style, style stories, price points, and um, optom and eye care stories. So I've got 21 seconds left. <laughs> um, and the last um, thing, a principle around um, rewilding is constantly changing. Nature is a living being and is constantly adapting and changing. And a company is continuously evolving too, as am I. So which takes me back to the not to do list. So five years in, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back doing talks. <laughs> Um, and look, I wish I had some sort of fancy reason that um, uh, those first few profile pieces are, are kind of back in existence, but really it came to, I, I'm building a business and I'm building, trying to build a culture and, and it became very apparent that it was important that we build our profile for our team to feel um, recognised and also um, proud of the work that we're doing. And then finally, um, mandarins. So you'll notice that that's not crossed off <laughs> um, because weird and so weird. Last week when I was writing my talk, and little did someone know that I'd put mandarins in my list, and then someone turned up this week with mandarins. <laughs> and I was very happy to accept them. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>